Hi. Um, thank you. Today we have Mayor Sambus Diki with us, and we are Angry Boba Time Podcast. And thank you so much for joining us today. How are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So we have this show because we want this is a Asian American Heritage uh, Month, and then we just kind of want, want to like talk to you about. Um, being a minority woman leader, what has your experiences be? Uh, is what is like unique to your challenges being an Asian American uh, in such a, a leadership role? Sure, I think, you know, I think about how I'm in this role and how it's really important that I'm not the last person in this role, <laughs> right? And so we have to make sure that we are uh, making sure it's easy to run or easier and encouraging other women and other Asian Americans to run for office, right? And be in government. The halls of government, they're lonely, mm -hmm. right? There's not a lot of people who look like us. Uh, <laughs> and we also have to uh, be this beacon for residents, right? Residents call us because they see someone who looks like them, who may speak their language, who, you know, understands their lived life experience. And they're like, huh, government makes, you know, is a little bit more personal now, right? And so for me, I think there's certainly been barriers, but I've been able to overcome them because, you know, I have good relationships and it's an ongoing process, right? So uh, I think for me, it's this mantra of you can't be what you can't see. Mm -hmm. And so I carry that with me and know that I'm here for a reason, right? And that the imposter syndrome it's easy to be like, oh, I don't belong here, but I do belong here, you know, <laughs> and so, and as do so many others. And so mm -hmm. for me, it's about opening up uh, that opportunity for, for more people to get involved. So you grew up in Cambridge where you were like a little girl. Have you ever imagined yourself like one day I will be like, you know, the president of the United <laughs> States and if, well, also the mayor of Cambridge? <laughs> That's funny. People are always like, oh, like, do you want to be president? And I'm like, well, I was born in Pakistan, oh, okay. so I can't. And they're like, oh, okay, well, you know. Um, if, so, yeah, sometimes I pass by City Hall and I see my name and I'm like, oh, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, that's me. And so, you know, I think I couldn't have imagined it. And also growing up here, I really benefited from so many of the resources here. You know, we were able to live in affordable housing, mm -hmm. right? We were able to access good programs. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, that my twin brother and I were able to go to summer camp, go to go to things. And so all those uh, resources helped us. Right. And, you know, I got involved more locally. And I remember in high school coming to City Hall and coming and, and, and talking about, you know, lowering the voting age. And I was looking at the city council, the mayor, and I was like, wow, they're listening to me. You know, this is, seems like a cool job. I want to do it one day. And I had in the back of my head, I was like, I don't know how I'm going to get here, but maybe one day I can be in this room. And, you know, that was what? That was in 2005, 2004, right? And, uh, you know, I, I went to law school. I, I, I graduated from college. I did a lot of the different things. And ultimately in 2016, when the Trump, there was a Trump election, I kind of looked inward and said, huh, I, you know, I got involved and I saw that election happening. And after that, I just saw the Islamophobia, the anti-hate, Asian hate, you know, everything uh, that was coming from the president. And I said, you know, I want to run for office. And the rest is history. Were your family like supportive of your decision to run for office? I, my family was confused. <laughs> uh, and, uh, they they were kind of you know my mom is a cashier at a grocery store my dad has been a grocery clerk he's a shipping clerk now and they were kind of like okay well is this gonna pay you they were very worried about money because you know you understand immigrants they mm -hmm. don't have my parents in particular they didn't their professional careers from their respective home countries countries didn't carry home carry, carry here and so for them it was like you make money and yeah. you you don't live you don't end up like us that's what they kept saying so when i told them about this they were like okay well we don't know what it'll look like but my dad i think was more supportive and my mom was just like oh my gosh what are you doing but then i i won my first election and my mom actually 
it was the first time she voted in a municipal election. Wow. Yeah. So she voted for me, you know, and so she was oh, so you happy. Sure? <laughs> I, I hope so. I hope so. There were 27 other candidates that year, you know, so I think they now have seen since I've become mayor and then became mayor again, they're like, oh, wow. You know, now they're like my mom, you know, she's the, she's, as I've said, she's a cashier and she's been a real, um, how do I say this? She, she's gotten, you know, a lot of support from me. She, <laughs> her customers, they're, she just, they come in and she's just like, vote for my daughter, vote for my daughter, nice. please. This is my daughter. I'm like, she's so, and then she goes door knocking. Like wow. she's just been a huge advocate. Um, but I still think she's kind of like, okay, what is happening long term? But they see the impact that I have and how I can help people. And I think they realize like, to me, life is more than, it's not about the money. It's not about, you know, these awards or accolades. It's really, for me, it's about helping people. Yeah. Uh, that's why it's really funny because I feel like every Asian person I know who are in like the creative space who does like stand up or improv, they already have like a PhD or something. Then they can pursue this channel because their parents would be like, <laughs> okay, fine, you go ahead. <laughs> right, right. We feel like, okay, we'll get this degree for you. But really like then you're like, oh, you want to be happy, right? And you're like, yeah. mom, dad, like. I'm going to do something else, you know? Yeah. So you mentioned that you, you know, had experienced barriers, but like you overcame them. And I was just wondering, like, what what does that mean for you? Like, how 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 do you do that? Sure. Yeah, I think I'll, I guess how used to. I mean, I think in, a, in a, any race, you have to raise money. Right. And that's kind of like what you have to focus on. And for me, I kind of said, OK, I know I need to raise X amount of money for these elections, but I'm not going to like get so bogged down in raising money um, and keep it focused on the people and going door knocking and really spending time with community. And I think if you see how I've done in the last three elections, I am the person who raises the least amount of money, but gets the most votes, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think this strategy if I run for higher office, won't work. You know, you just need yeah. more money. I mean, we need campaign re finance reform. Oh my gosh. Oh, I think I, do, do you want to talk about that? Well, <laughs> you know, I think it's really problematic how much we have to spend on our elections. Mm -hmm. You know, people are raising uh, more money in like a five month time period than people make in a year, yeah. you know? And I, you know, I think there's a better use for some of this money. And so I think about our f federal elections, our state elections, and the money in politics, we gotta, we have to figure, fix that. Yeah, and I, I think I read somewhere how once a like a national election ends, it's basically just planning for the next election, mm -hmm. and so you just have people like on circuits, just tra like the travel expense alone, you know, just like holding the talks. It's like so much planning and, and it's all for show. And like, because the cycle is so short, it doesn't leave much time for like actually, um, you know, like making good on the promises <laughs> that you uh, promise for the, you know, the previous election. I mean, this is like on the national level, but I mean, I feel like you work really hard. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the work that you've done since coming into office because you've done so much on like racial justice and tenants rights and it's very awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I, you know, I reflect back on the you know, last few years and especially during COVID, we when I became mayor, it, it was kind of like, oh, wow, I... I'm going to be dealing with COVID the entire time. And, uh, but in that, we saw a lot of opportunity too. You know, we raised, we relaunched this uh, and repurposed the, the Mayor's Disaster Relief Fund for COVID-19, which has raised $5 million, right? That went directly to residents. Um, we were also able to launch a guaranteed income pilot, um, which is providing $500 a month to 100 30 single caretakers, you know, we're more than halfway through this 18 month pilot and we're seeing how it's really benefiting our, these residents. And now we're going to be expanding on that and using American Rescue Plan money and doing an even bigger, um, bigger demonstration uh, and providing more money to families. Right. I think, you know, you think about what our role is and it, it's to make 
people's lives better. And that can look like a lot of different things. You know, an example I have, small example, but some families had said to me, this was a while ago, you know, they're Muslim families. And they said, look, you know, our kids are coming home hungry because they're not eating the food at school because it's not halal, you know? And they said, you know, I went to the principal, I went to the teacher, no one's really helping us. So they came to me and I got involved and we got the right people together and I got them at the table explaining what halal food means to them and why it's important. And lo and behold, we are one of the companies that we contract with. They offered meat that's halal. We could just ask for that meat, you know? And like, it was that simple kind of, okay, we can do this. You know, it took a little while and now we have some more halal options. It's not every day, but it's much more than it used to be. So thinking about, you know, something like that to these larger structural issues, you know, around tenant rights, you know, around, you know, various uh, uh, other topics. So I, I think I feel lucky that I get to be an advocate, you know? I don't know if it's okay for me to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. anyway. Um, during COVID, we see a lot of like art um, sort of instruction, uh, sorry, institutions and then organization and nonprofit and the people who are in the arts uh space uh, suffering a lot and then um, often America has this culture is obviously not just Cambridge or even not just Massachusetts have don't have this like culture to support people who are in the arts uh, like some country country they like give money to um, artists um, sometimes like doing COVID and stuff what do you what do you, is do you think like the government role on like supporting more like artists or people who are in usually in this creative space are are not like making a lot of money but they do contribute to our culture significantly yeah you know mm -hmm. i think we need to compensate our uh, artists for every all the work that they do you know and i think about even the money that we used in the marriage disaster relief fund we had specific money to arts organizations you know we said we need to support the arts the arts is what is getting us through the pandemic you know the stand up the you know, everything moved on online and so forth. So I do think there's a gap in how we value, mm -hmm. you know, artists, how we value, um, you know, so many different fields that do contribute a lot, but we really, um, we're really slow in recognizing. So um, definitely, I, I think we need to do more. And I think as a city, uh, Cambridge, we can do more. Do you feel like um, Cambridge is kind of a bubble in terms of like the progressiveness and uh, like willingness to change and like because you're so successful with a lot of the uh changes that you've made like do you feel like it can be um you know done in other communities in massachusetts and beyond i think we're spoiled here <laughs> yeah. we're very spoiled yeah. Yeah. and you know i've worked in places like lawrence lowell and lynn and i think here we've been able to, to do a lot because we have the resources and because we have the resources it's our responsibility to do in, even more and i think where we get caught up is like we are like we're doing this this and that you know and people are like you know we're doing more than others and it's like yeah uh, and we should be doing more you know so i do think given where we're at we absolutely need to be you know doing more to help people and i think that's where we I think struggle and I think sometimes it's kind of like okay we're in this competition of like who can be more progressive you know and so I think about being uh, an elected official in other parts of the country and I think I'd have a much harder time right and I think here we have people who are like-minded you know I think the biggest arguments we have are around bike lanes and housing you know <laughs> you know and like you know there's a lot of people who are like yes housing but it's like but not right there you know, <laughs> but they're going to have a Black Lives Matter sign. You know, that's controversial yeah, to say, yeah. but they're going to have signs that say immigrants welcome Black Lives Matter. But as soon as there's like a development nearby that's going to, you know, harm them in their in their opinion, um, their attitude changes. And so there's a lot of those attitudes that I think are problematic in our city. And I think I've encountered it a lot and I listen and I say you know I, I just disagree take care you know 
what what kind of what kind of response do you usually get after you say I disagree? Usually they're just shocked and then yeah, you know, some people are very mean, and you just get used to it. Like I have learned through this job, like I can't take things too personally, you know. And I think people think they know me, you know. They're like, you're this, you're that, and I'm like, you know, I you get a nasty email, I'll reply to that email, but never send it. <laughs> You know, I will just, I will have it in my notes and then I'll take a deep breath. I'll walk away. But I just don't get it let to you, get to you because it's the same people who, who are um, coming after you and your biggest critics. And it's just a reality of the, the role that you're in. I stay out of it. I don't let some of these voices get to me. It's hard. It's hard. Mm-hmm. Um, but that. You have to just deal with it. Yeah, I I just feel like you're so comfortable with who you are just as you are. And I feel like especially for like Asian people and like women, like it's hard to do that. Like every time somebody tells me, oh, you need to like change (laughs) your hair a certain way. I was like, (gasps) you know, like I just like I'm like second guessing myself. And it's just like, how do you stay you? Because like. Yeah, it's amazing. It's like they don't, they don't even need to say you need to change your hair. They just say, "Oh, your hair look different," and immediately you'll be like, "What is yeah. wrong with my hair today? <laughs> Tell me." Yeah, you know, I think I'm a work. I'm a work in progress, right? And so I think I still have a way to go. But you know, I think there's some things that I'm just, uh, you know, just even this morning, uh, someone was like, "Oh yeah, we've met," you know, and I couldn't remember them. You know, I was like, oh, we have we? You know, I like like a, a, a different politician would be like, oh, yes, I do remember. That's not authentic to me. I'm going to say, like, I'm so sorry. Like, I, I don't remember meeting you. <laughs> and maybe that's mean or maybe that's a little too forward. But I'm not going to kind of be fake, you know, and just say, like, sometimes it's just like they had a mask on. So maybe if they didn't, I had, I would have asked, oh, do, you know. I probably would have recognized who you were. Um, so that's just like a, a thing of like, sometimes it's like a work in progress, but it is, it's one of those things where it's day to day, you know, sometimes I feel really positive and then other times I'm just like, oh, you got to really dig deep and find that courage to be on, you know? It just seems like you have like a very deep well of reserves. <laughs> Like a deep reservoir of courage. No, like yes, really see. inspiring. I have a, gr- a lot of good support. You know, I have a great group of friends and relationships, and um, you know, it, it's a it's just day by day. Like, what do you do to sort of like get away or refresh yourself? I love TV, so I will watch a lot of TV just by myself and just watch my shows. You know, I'm still watching Grey's Anatomy. 19, 20 years later, um, I think I'm the only one. Uh, you know, I'll go on hikes. I'll, I'll listen to music. I'll make time for friends and see people. Um, yeah, I try to just get out and walk. Um, yeah, so I try to, you know, try to read some memoirs, read some books. Just, you know, go on little trips, weekend trips. And I just got back from two nights. Well, technically three nights in Puerto Rico. Wow. People were like, you just went for that time I'm like yeah but it's exactly what I needed you know I went with two of my best friends and we had traveling took a while but like then we got to spend two full days just together that's that's worth it you know so you have to make time and block off your calendar and make time for those types of things um I want to be conscious of time but Maybe this is a controversial uh, mm-hmm. question, but what's your favorite restaurant in Cambridge? Oh, gosh. Um, do I have a favorite restaurant? Um, I ha- I can start with some a coffee shop that I love. I love Choreo Coffee in East Cambridge. The waffles are so good. Um, as far as restaurants, um, I like this restaurant called Tallulah. Uh, it's, it's in kind of West Cambridge area. They have like a nice... They have just nice outdoor seating, really good dessert. I love Italian food, so they have a lot of good pastas. So, yeah, I think that's one of definitely, I've frequented that uh, a good amount. Um, obviously, Life Alive is 
next door. So we I go love to, Life Alive. So yeah. I go to, I used to like not like it and be like, oh, it's so expensive. Everyone's in yoga pants. Uh, I don't, I don't fit in. I don't fit in. And then I just, I'm like, it's so good. Adventurable all the way. So yeah, yeah, there's a lot of great restaurants here. I'm blanking on some of the other places, but I, La, La Fabrica has really good mofongo uh, and really good mojitos, coconut. Love mojito. Yeah. I love mojito. Yeah. So go there for a good, good mojito. So I have a kind of a controversial question. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I, I really like how you called out like the like kind of white liberal hypocrisy because like, I mean, there's like some other places in the country where, you know, they'll, the city will vote to like put, you know, re- like a prison or, you know, a homeless shelter in an Asian neighborhood. And then when the Asian people complain about it to the city, like the white progressive people will shame them because, you know, it's like, well, why, why don't you want mm. to help the homeless or something? But it's like they never, I mean, like they never say, okay, sure, you know, we'll invite these people near our homes. So it's like, I guess, I don't even know <laughs> if it's a question, but it's just like, how do you deal with that? all the time yeah you know i think i go back to my roots and i grew up in affordable housing so i will always vote for supporting more housing um and figuring out policies that enable more of that um you know i think i do want to listen to the residents too you know we have an affordable housing development that um these owners want to build more on their property and the conditions of their current units have been so horrible. And so the residents were like, and then a lot of the white eyelids got involved because they were kind of like, well, we don't want this tall, uh, more building in our housing. And then they kind of were like, and the residents are really unhappy and we're going to support the residents because they don't want this. And it was like this weird thing, you know? And I was like, it didn't feel good. So what I did was, you know, me and the vice mayor, we wrote a letter to the owners and said, you know, you need to fix your current stock before you build new stock. I want them to build new stock, but I want them to also take care of their current residents. And, you know, some of the folks who, you know, the white liberal folks, you know, I think are pleased that we're pushing hard on the developers. I mean, and sometimes I kind of question their I think motives, you know, because I'm kind of like, I know you're supporting these residents in their advocacy, but they, or you're also really concerned about more housing getting built. And so I've kind of said, look, I, we need to hold these folks accountable and we need to build more housing. So I think you can do both things and you just have to call, I just call things out, you know, and I will always vote a certain way um, because I know it'll help the residents. I think that's it. But thank you so much for joining our talk today. And it's a beautiful day. I yeah, hope you have a great day. memorial weekend. Thank you. You too.